Okay, we're going to talk about the use of ultrasound in pediatric patients, both in terms of cardiac ultrasound and also some useful applications in the abdomen. When we look at the heart, uh, we want to use the, the P21. And seeing the heart, which is uh, has to be sometimes a deeper structure in the body. So we have to get the sound to sort of penetrate deeper into the body, which is why we like to use this lower frequency, small footprint phased array transducer. Whenever you look at the heart, I think it's helpful to look at it in multiple windows. The first window we think about is a sub-xiphoid uh, view, and uh, what you're going to do actually aim the beam towards the chin of the patient. Now, you always think about the heart sort of being on the left side of the screen, but uh, actually what we're really trying to do is aim the beam towards the patient's chin, and uh, in doing so, we still use that liver as our margin. You see, the sun inadvertently aim the beam towards the patient's left, then we wouldn't have the liver anymore and we wouldn't be able to see the heart at all. We'd be shining the sound right up into the chest. So in patients who have really small livers for whatever reason, this sub xiphoid view is not a very good window. The larger the liver, the better this window is. In order to get the liver to really come out from under the rib cage towards the probe, what you can do is have the patient take a deep breath. And what we see in the sub xiphoid view is the following. Here's the liver and then we can see the right ventricle and then the left ventricle. Here's the right atrium and here's the left atrium. So the right side of the heart is closer to the liver whereas the left side of the heart is further down into the body. And we can see over here, once we have a pericardial effusion, it's seen as a separation between that sort of anterior pericardium and the myocardium. In fact, this pericardial effusion is all the way around, including around the posterior region of the heart as well. Now about 15% of the time, because some patients have small livers um, or other issues, it's really difficult to obtain a sub xiphoid view. So it's good to know um, some other tricks up your sleeve, such as the parasternal long axis. And as its name suggests, it's para next to sternum in the long axis of uh, the heart. And we use the cardiology orientation, which is where we take the indicator and we aim it this way so that the apex is towards the indicator on the screen. So again, this parasternal view, here's our sternum right here. We're almost actually on top of the sternum. We're just to the side of it, and that's my indicator right there. We can see it's that little nipple with this little groove next to it. And we're going to aim the, that, that indicator towards the patient's left. Therefore, the apex of the heart will be on the side of the screen where the indicator is. And we can see the indicator is over here, which is why the sort of the apex of the heart is seen over here. We can see it also here as well. Apex of the heart towards the indicator because that's which way we aim the indicator. Now this is a three-chambered view of the heart. We can see the right ventricle and we can see the left ventricle and here's the left atrium. And basically the blood is going from the left atrium through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. Aortic outflow tract. Screening athletes for heart problems, Dr. Barry Ramo reveals how certain tests can save lives. It seems like every week we hear about competitive athletes dying suddenly on the playing field. The question is, should competitive athletes be periodically screened for heart problems before they compete? A recent study published in the British Medical Journal found if athletes were the risk of sudden cardiac arrest could be detected to be saved. In Italy, where all athletes are screened, scientists looked at more than 30,000 athletes who underwent an electrocardiogram and found almost 5% of them had some heart abnormality that could lead to sudden death. According to researchers, a young athlete dies every three days from an undiagnosed heart problem. In cases, the problem goes undetected until they compete. The major cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes is a disease called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Often patients with this family history of sudden cardiac death or they'll have some physical findings on examination. But the best test is an echocardiogram. Which
during routine screening of athletes, whether they're professional athletes or whether they're just regular high school athletes. But that might be something in the future to weed out those kids who are at high risk for sudden cardiac death. For Health Beat. So with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, what happens is the septum of the heart gets very thickened. And once it gets thickened, it gets harder for the blood to get pumped out the aorta. And you can see, in fact, this blood here doesn't even get out the aorta. Um, once, it, once the patient's exercise and this gets even a little bit enlarged, the blood can't get back out that aortic valve. And so what you can do is, once you make the diagnosis, you can come in and, and inject alcohol in here, and that shrinks down that interventricular septum, thereby making it easier for the, um, the blood to get out the aortic valve. Um, listed there, but um, essentially um, what happens is the physical exam can only pick up about 3% of the patients before they experience sudden cardiac death. Um, one study found that the incidence of sudden cardio cardiovascular death in young competitive athletes declined in the Veneto region in Italy by can detect hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with 80% accuracy. What you're going to do is you're going to look at that septum. And we can see this is the septum in that parasternal long axis. That's why I'm always talking about the parasternal long axis because you can see that septum so well. And so at the end of systole, where it's the thickest, you would drop some calipers along this area right here. And if the calipers are less than 15 millimeters, then, well, actually, a normal septum is anywhere from 0 0.8 to 1.2 millimeters. Now, in somebody who undergoes a lot of exercise, sometimes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be mistaken for something known as athlete's heart. Now, both involve a growth of the myocardium. However, um, athlete's heart is generally not correlated with the incidence of sudden cardiac death. While hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be linked to family history, athlete's heart arises purely as a function of intense exercise, usually at least an hour a day, every day. Since the body is operating at high training levels, the heart adapts and grows in order to pump the blood more efficiently. Stoppage of exercise for three months generally leads to a decrease in the wall and the septum thickness in those with athlete's heart, whereas those with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy exhibit no decline. So people with athlete's heart do not exhibit an abnormally enlarged septum and the growth of the heart muscle at the septum and the free ventricular wall is actually symmetrical. Whereas with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we see asymmetrical growth um, and a less uh, dilated left ventricle. This in turn leads to a smaller volume of blood that can leave the heart with each beat. Now, you can see that... Um, with athlete's heart, it's usually less than 15 millimeters at the septum, whereas in hypertroph hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's greater than 15 millimeters, and um, it's not symmetric, and we want to definitely get a good family history from these patients, and if you're worried about it, you can check them again in three months if they stop exercising, and athlete's heart should return to normal, whereas um, it stays the same with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Another thing that happens is um, you can get a systolic your leaflet, which further obstructs the outflow tract. So here is a cardiac ultrasound showing a systolic anterior motion of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve during systole. So as the heart's squeezing during systole, look what happens. You can see that anterior leaflet flip up anteriorly and block that outflow track. I'll get my arrow out of the way so you can see it and see if I can pause it right when it happens. Right there. So we can see here at end systole this leaflet flips up and actually occludes the flow of blood trying to get out of the aorta. That's another finding with hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. And you can see how thick this septum look for in um, kids and 
um, what you look for is an anechoic or jet black fluid in the pericardial space. We see this with pericarditis. We see this with trauma. It can be from uremic uh, causes, malignant causes, and sometimes we don't know what causes it. Um, we see both acute and chronic uh, pericardial effusions, knowing full well that in the acute patient, um, actually anywhere from 80 to 200 cc's, depending on the age of the patient, is enough to cause um, the fluid in the pericardial space to be greater than the ability of the ventricle to fill. In other words, that's called pericardial tamponade, that the, the heart can no longer expand in the sac of fluid and the patient can die. Uh, now, chronically, you can see huge pericardial effusions. In fact, this picture here is uh, one in which we did an ultrasound guided pericardial synthesis, and you can see. renal failure and basically we were able to take a liter off her heart because it took so long to accumulate that the pericardium was able to stretch over a long period of time but when you get stabbed the pericardium can only accumulate uh, up to 200 cc's at the most before you get to pericardial tamponade. Now sometimes the, the, air, the material can look echogenic with various shades of, of swirling um, echoes in there. You can see different types of uh, fusions like pus um, if it's an infection, blood with vibrant or malignant um, effusions. And uh, the other thing is after somebody has a recent upper respiratory infection, we do see a lot of sort of um, physiologic, asymptomatic, trivial pericardial effusions. It's not, it's, uh, it's not uncommon to see that at all. I see this on models quite a bit, actually. So it's just something to think about. And then the next question somebody always asks me is, how can I measure the amount of It's just, you just sort of get an eyeball appearance of it. Uh, basically, if there's more than a centimeter stripe of distance between the pericardium and the myocardium, that's when I start to get a little concerned about it. Less than a centimeter fluid stripe doesn't bother me too much. And you can see that these are one centimeter hash marks over here on the scale. Somebody who's got uh, quite a large pericardial effusion. In fact, that was from the patient you just saw in that last image here. We drew a thousand cc's of fluid off this particular heart and I mean there's portions where there's like you know um, five centimeters of, of fluid basically between the between the pericardium and the myocardium. So it's a very large pericardial effusion. Here's a smaller one here and actually um, people are, are always asking me about this one. I'll just point out the reason I get questioned about it because people see um, material in the pericardial space. They say uh, I don't know. I don't really care. There's a pretty good sized stripe here, more than a centimeter. And in fact, it stretches to go around posteriorly as well uh, around this patient's heart. So that's a little bit concerning. Um, but um, so, yeah, so what's in there? Some fibrous material, could be some fat. Um, but my eye is really trained to look for the pericardial effusion in that subxiphoid view. Here's uh, another subxiphoid view showing another pericardial effusion, a couple centimeters there of a fluid stripe seen uh, anteriorly. We can also see that fluid marching around posteriorly as well. Um, now, on the parasternal long axis, um, this is what a pericardial effusion looks like here. And we can see the heart swinging back and forth a bit. Uh, we see that when we see larger pericardial effusions. Uh, and so during um, systole, at the end of, end of systole, we can see the heart, the pericardium up here pull away. The myocardium pulls away from its pericardium. We also see it posteriorly as well. But if you look very closely, I want you to pay close attention to something here. This is the descending aorta. This circle right here is the descending aorta that we see on the parasternal long axis. And here is this pericardial effusion that tracks anterior to the descending aorta. In other words, it's between the left atrium and the descending aorta. We can see this wedge of fluid tracking up here. And that's what def defines this as a pericardial effusion. If this fluid was to track posteriorly behind the descending aorta, then we'd be more worried about a pleural effusion or fluid in the chest. Now, this next scan is somebody who came in with abdominal pain, right upper quadrant abdominal pain, a fourth-year medical student uh, last summer uh, did this study, went to the bedside, looked at the gallbladder, scanning through the gallbladder, but in the corner of his eye saw this down here on his scan. 
and thought, that's strange. What is that? And focused in on it more. And look at this. This patient has quite a large pericardial uh, effusion there. And um, this patient actually ended up needing to go uh, to the um, cath lab to get a, uh, a pericardial, pericardial synthesis. We can see there's two to three centimeters here of fluid between the anterior pericardium and the myocardium. Um, and it was incidentaloma, uh, incidental finding where we were looking for gallstones. The patient had abdominal pain. Yeah, there's some language barrier there. Um, they came for the abdominal pericardial synthesis. So, so what really is pericardial tamponade then you're probably wondering? Well, um, pericardial tamponade is when you have diastolic collapse of the right heart. And that's the main thing. So during diastole, you would expect the heart to fill. But if it paradoxically collapses during diastole, that's when there's so much fluid around the heart in the pericardium that it's causing the heart to collapse when it should be expanding. And, uh, and that's the sonographic definition. The clinical definition is large pericardial effusion plus hypotension or plus severe shortness of breath. Um, sometimes we see stuff around the heart. It could be epicardial fat, so you want to be a little careful there. Um, what do you think is going on here? A couple things I can see. Number one, uh, it's a subxiphoid view the liver here. We can see the pericardium out here. This is the myocardium, and it's a little subtle, but do you see this area? here that's adjacent to the myocardium, that's epicardial fat. Now this is overgained. Yes, like you, I feel like I need to wear sunglasses when I look at it. Just keep in mind that this is a, a here. This out here is something different. What do you think this is? So far, the pericardial effusions that you've seen have all been anechoic, but this one's got basically some echoes to it. And this is what a, uh, a clot looks like. This is a basically a patient who's got tamponade with a blood clot in the peri uh, pericardium. How do I know this is tamponade? Well, look at directly, we see the, um, the trampoline effect. It looks like there's uh, a little tiny person jumping up and down on this patient's right ventricle, and it actually, the right ventricle um, decreases during diastole, and that's the sonographic definition of tamponade right there. Also, uh, this patient was very symptomatic, very short. Now, the other thing is uh, cardiac standstill. This is actually a video of a heart that's no longer moving. It's still image, but it's not. It's actually a video. And uh, these are the chambers here. Sometimes the heart is hard to pick out when it's not moving. You're used to seeing the heart move. Uh, but when the patient uh, expires uh, and the heart stops moving, um, we can see it here. And um, there's been several studies to show once the patient has cardiac standstill, they have uh, a near universal 0% um, survival rate. And so this may be one particular that, um, that you may be looking for in some of your codes. A patient who was in a car accident, um, it was a blunt, blunt uh, traumatic full arrest. When we have a patient with blunt traumatic full arrest, what uh, we usually think there's really not much we can do for them. With penetrating trauma to the chest with pericardial effusion, we immediately do um, uh, a, a thoracotomy, but with blunt trauma, it's less clear. Well, in this particular patient here, um, they didn't actually have a pulse at all. We felt no carotid pulse, yet we saw this heart beating around quite a bit, swinging around in its sac. Clearly, this is pericardial tamponade. In the setting of blunt trauma, it was a little bit confusing. Um, when you look at the mechanism a little bit closer, the patient wasn't wearing a seatbelt, hit the sternum, and uh, probably a rib fractured and poked the, 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 uh, the pericardium, causing this... Um, pericardial tamponade. Um, so what's the next step in the trauma bay when we have somebody who's got blunt traumatic full arrest with pericardial tamponade? Um, well, the next step in the trauma bay is not to do a pericardial synthesis, but rather do this, which is a okay, thoracotomy. Right. And so um, yeah. we did. Um, we used the ribs. You know, we cut the patient open, uh, and then we used the rib spreaders to spread apart the ribs, and we get all these clots out of the chest and out of the, out of the pericardium as well. Um, and when you continue the thoracotomy all the way to the other side, uh, that's clamshell. Um, but it's something we always look for now in our blunt trauma patients and who are in cardiac arrest to, uh, to try to rescue them from that. And the person that you see right here, has, it did, did come back to life and actually was discharged from the hospital. 
um, even though they got an, uh, an emergency department thoracotomy. So we've had several patients now over the years survive an, um, an emergency department thoracotomy um, who had blunt traumatic full arrest. Now, um, switching gears now, I'm going to talk about um, CT scans in kids. And I know this is an ultrasound talk, but I want to just bring your attention to something that many of you may not be aware of, and that's that we've had an unbelievable increase in the amount of CAT scanning going on uh, throughout our emergency departments. And this was a study published three years ago showing just that, um, that over the last of the prior six years, in 2000, 2006, we saw just gigantic increases in the amount of CT scans for the various uh, modalities. And this is not in adults, this is, this is all in, in kids. And so it's something to be concerned about because um, kids respond to radiation uh, a little bit differently. And, uh, and as this chart shows here, um, kids, they basically have more radiosensitive tissue and they live a longer life and so cancer can develop. Um, it can take a longer, in certain cancers that take a longer time to develop, they will um, develop in, in younger people at, because they have longer time to live to get those cancers. And so um, this is um, what happens when you get um, this increase in CT scans. You can see here, this is the estimated radiation-induced cancer risk um, in kids compared to adults. And as friendly as we try to make our, our CT scanners for kids, it's really not a friendly thing to do to a kid to This is basically 100 millisieverts of, um, of radiation um, uh, and the number of cancer deaths per 100,000 patients who were exposed to 100 millisieverts of radiation. So that's a couple of CT scans, um, two or three CT scans uh, right there. And so you can see if, if at an early age, basically this is the, the fulcrum right here. Once you're below the age of 35 and you're exposed to, you know, three CT scans or so, you have um, significantly higher rates of cancer than when you get it when you're over the age of, of 35. So it's just something to think about. Um, I try to really curtail my use of CT scans in younger patients whenever I can. One particular strategy was suggested by uh, Lamaris in 2009 who said, well, what if we used ultrasound first and then CT scans? This was uh, 1,021 patients um, for the diagnosis of urgent conditions. And uh, while CT was significantly more sensitive than ultrasound, it is a better test um, in terms of its accuracy. The overall highest sensitivity actually used a combined approach using initial ultrasound, then CT, and this actually was able to reduce radiation by 50%. So that's something to think about. If we got good, if we got better with ultrasound and really thought about it a lot more, especially in kids, we could, um, avoid the need for CT scans. So in about about half the time. So I'm going to go through how we could use it in the pediatric abdomen now in terms of three potential diagnoses, pyloric stenosis, intussusception, and uh, appendicitis. So um, it turns out that ultrasound in kids are, are good matches for one another. Kids are very um, what I call sonogenic, and it's because they don't have a lot of fat, basically, and they're small, so we can use higher frequency transducers. And they have a lot of cartilage compared to the amount of um, ossified bone, and so ultrasound goes right through cartilage very easily. It does once the bones get get ossified and they get you know very dense, the sound gets reflected. So kids have lots of cartilage, which is down a mom's lap and uh, scan the child. Uh, right there without any sedation at all, so you don't need um, to sedate them, which um, has mixed, uh, you know, if, if you s whenever you sedate a kid, um, you have to sort of control their airway, and it puts them at risk uh, for a complication there, so we do it when we need to, but if we can avoid that, uh, it's, it's a good thing. And this is an example here of uh, a patient who's got appendicitis, and this is what it looks like. This is the, the skin line up here. This is some muscle, and this is the appendix swollen uh, right here and it's uh, greater than six millimeters, actually wall-to-wall -wall measures 1.03 centimeters. And that's what acute appendicitis looks like. Um, which probe do you think we're gonna use? Well, um, normally when we look in the abdomen on adults, we have to use this probe here, uh, but on kids, we actually get to use 
this probe here, my favorite probe, because it's got such high frequency and makes such pretty images. Now, one of the techniques that uh, you want to use whenever you work with kids, um, of course, um, you want to use a high frequency linear probe, put the patient in the parent's lap, lie the patient supine as best you can. It actually helps to bend their knees a little bit too. Um, but um, it's this part right here, warm gel. It's amazing how the cold gel on the kid can, you know, it's like you're bringing a little squirrel over to eat a nut out of your hand and all of a sudden you freak them out with the, with the cold gel. So put some warm gel on there. Uh, we have a gel warmer uh, that we keep a bottle set aside for kids with. Uh, in our, it's actually in our heater for our warm blankets as well. So um, that's the way to go. Now, um, let's first talk about pyloric stenosis. So pyloric stenosis is where you get um, thickening of uh, the hypertrophy of the pyloric muscle here. And um, it occurs in about 1 to 250 kids at a male to female ratio of 4 to 1 very, very early in life. You know, that neonate that comes in with non-bilious projectile vomiting, every single one of these kids is um, consideration for um, pyloric stenosis. Now, on physical exam, it's historically shown that um, you want to palpate the olive. And basically, you push around on the abdomen trying to feel this thing right here, which is this um, stenotic uh, hypertrophy pyloric valve. And actually, palpating the ol olive was only shown to be uh, present in about 23% of, of patients. Um, whereas ultrasound has uh, very good test characteristics to pick up um, pylor pyloric stenosis. Now, the ultrasound images of the gastric pylorus, um, when it's greater than 1.6 centimeters uh, in length or four millimeters in thickness, and so right here, this is the length right here, if that distance from here to here is greater than 1.6, or if the thickness is greater than 4 millimeters, then we think about um, pyloric stenosis. Um, and you do this in real time, and you'll see peristaltic waves from the proximal stomach, um, which do not transmit the fluid down through the fundus. So this is the proximal stomach here, and um, we th there'll be peristalsing. The stomach will be squeezing, but it can't get the fluid through this stenotic uh, pylorus. Um, some of the limitations here is if the patient's crying, you have to kind of do this between the cries. So if the patient goes, wah, you can't really do it then. But when they, between the cries, and they go to take a breath, everything relaxes, and that's when you can get in and get a good view. So sometimes you, you only get the view while they're crying between uh, the cries. And um, if there's a lot of bowel gas, if, if you're, actually if the patient has a bowel obstruction, there's a lot of bowel gas everywhere, this can be somewhat difficult um, study to do and if they've been crying a lot sometimes they swallow out of air and we know air is the enemy of ultrasound so instead of being nice fluid in here or formula whatever this is there's air in there and that can get in your way so that's a couple of the limitations um, but a lot of times when the child vomits a lot of gas comes out of the stomach and we actually get um, rid of that air so vomiting can be a helpful thing when doing ultrasound so the technique is basically you want to give the patient some clear fluid to drink um, some Pedialyte and let them suck that down uh, if they can and uh, that will really make this uh, job way easier and aim the indicator of the patient's right and then um, you start in that kind of riper quadrant area down towards or should I say over towards the epigastric area and um, in the transverse section it looks like a donut and you just saw what it looked like in the longitudinal section these are the two views here we can see the pyloric uh, canal length if it's greater than 14 millimeters if the thickness is greater than 3 millimeters and if the diameter um, I should say the diameter uh, here is more than um, 11 millimeters um, that's uh, suggestive of uh, pyloric stenosis we can see it over here to the diameter whereas the uh, muscle um, thickness is going to be from here to here this is the muscle thickness here and that's if that's greater than 3 millimeters we worry about pyloric stenosis. So those are the three things. The canal length, the diameter, and then the muscle thickness here. Um, again, this is how it looks uh, when it's positive. And we're going to change gears now and talk about intussusception. Now, intussusception is where you have telescop telescoping of the bowel segments. So you get the, um, and I had to kind of relearn this anatomy here, the intussusceptum is what telescopes into um, the intussuscipiens. 
what's this a seven seven can't pronounce it obviously uh, but that's the idea you get this this is called interception and this is what it looks like uh, when you're in the operating room and you're and you're demonstrating it uh, real time and it causes full-blown intestinal obstruction so patients come in with not surprisingly the triad of colicky abdominal pain vomiting and bloody stools unfortunately that classic triad like all classics in medicine is only present about 20 percent of the time the typical age range is three months up to two years now there is something um, called the uh, current jelly stools it's where you have blood plus poop it comes out looking like this current uh, jelly and um, luckily ultrasound very very good with interception it's got about a hundred uh, percent sensitivity to pick it up and the way you do this is um, you can um, and this is an example here of placing the patient in a warm uh, water bath here um, and holding the legs together as we're doing the ultrasound and by s holding the legs together specifically by sort of squeezing uh, the buttocks together um, that can um, help actually reduce some of this um, and, and fix the problem but to diagnose it though we're here with the ultrasound probe and we're looking at the ascending and then across to the transverse colon any areas that's non peristaltic because these interceptions they don't peristalse normally peristalsis occurs um, about every eight to ten seconds um, but you can stare at this bowel it's not going to peristalse and you'll see a mass or a target sign now this is what normal intestine looks like it's got sort of a layered appearance it's easily compressible and it's got intermittent peristalsis this is we can see here on the long axis of this bowel kind of cruising along there's air in it and so the air makes it so we can't see the rest of the bowel which is normal and in a short axis between peristalsis this is normal bowel here seen in a short axis here when it's it's uh, in the middle of peristalsis all the air gets kind of pushed aside and we see the actual rugae here of the bowel and that's what normal bowel looks like um, in a normal patient these are blood vessels down here and this is again what normal intestine looks like up here now within a susception on the other hand here's the problem in the short axis it really does look like a donut it's got this target configuration in a long axis we call this the uh, sometimes it's called the a fork sign or the pseudo kidney sign and um, got that target uh, formation here's another example here of the uh, target sign of uh, in a susception we can see layers of bowel um, seen with that hyperchoic segment around that uh, inner layer there and this is these layers and uh, here's another example here of uh, in a susception and and we wrote on here no peristalsis seen um, again it's that targeted layered appearance um, another example here of a pretty straightforward case we see layers of bowel along with the hyperchoic segment around the inner layer um, due to the invagination of the uh, mesentery that came through here this is the actual video of this patient um, we're right around the epigastric area under the liver we moved it over to the right upper quadrant and it's uh, where the ascending the transverse colon came together we can see the uh, intersusception um, starting to appear right there and uh, that's that's it right there there's actually kind of a long axis of it right there now we're in short at the end of it so that's the um, kind of what we're looking for now changing gears uh, one final time we're going to talk about appendicitis one of my favorite topics um, this is the most common surgical emergency in children uh, in children the peak of appendicitis is between age 9 and 12 years old and uh, again fever abdominal pain vomiting anorexia right lower quadrant pain generalized abdominal pain that then localizes itself uh, to the right lower quadrant it turns out about a third of kids present without that classic presentation and so whenever you have something that's not presenting classically you got to turn to imaging and um, and uh, you could you could get an x-ray but um, can you maybe get lucky and see what's called an appendicolith that's basically um, translates to essentially a poop stone sitting in the appendix what happens is um, a very sort of hardened calcified um, stool can occlude the lumen of the appendix as it comes off the cecum and that's what's known as an appendix
so um, we get a surgery consult in a lot of these patients, um, and the first thing the surgeons many times, um, well, historically have, have turned to has been CT scans. Lately, though, I've noticed that especially our surgeons at UCR are getting very good about using CT as a last resort. And so that's been very uh, reassuring to me, uh, the approach to, uh, to appendicitis. Um, but you can see why they've historically have turned to CT scans. The sensitivity for CT is actually, um, with the new CT scans, uh, the multi-detectors, it's all up around 96%, 98%. It's very, very good. Now with ultrasound, the sensitivity uh, depends. It's a very operator dependent thing. And some people are really good at doing these. Other people aren't. It takes a lot of patience. Um, the, the lower specificity that we see with ultrasound has to do with the fact that it's really difficult to see a normal appendix. And in fact, even in the best of hands, a normal appendix is seen less than 15% of the time. So feast your eyes on that, my friends. That is a normal appendix, which you rarely, if ever, see. We can see that. General woman I had who had right lower quadrant abdominal pain, and on this l longitudinal scan, we're able to see the, uh, the longitudinal scan of the appendix, I should say, the long axis of the appendix. We're able to see this tubular blind ended structure with nice thin walls. And if you measure from, from outer wall to outer wall, okay, here to here, here to here, here to here, you're going to get less than five millimeters. Um, and that's normal. If you can get up to six millimeters to have a normal appendix. Now, just to show you on a CT scan what it looks like, this is abdominal skin out here. This is fat. Uh, we can see all this around the, the body here. So this is actually the human being here. And this is all society uh, influence out here. This is all just fat and stuff. So, um, and that's w where ultrasound can be difficult if you have to compress all this fat here um, in order to get to see the, the muscle. So this is ab abdominal oblique muscle. This is the rectus abdominal uh, muscle here. And we can see this thickened appendix um, right here. And we can see the psoas muscle over here. So the idea is to compress this abdominal wall musculature until the appendix gets squished between abdominal oblique. Sometimes the appendix is a lot more medial. And we can actually or end up compressing this rectus muscle or abdominal oblique all the way down until you come in contact with the psoas muscle. And if you have acute appendicitis, the appendix gets stuck between these two muscle layers with ultrasound. So you're pushing the probe way out here and squishing the tissue all the way down. So you can imagine how much pain medication you may have to give a patient in order for them to allow you to compress it. And so basically, that's what you're doing. You're just kind of, it's like, you know, you wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. And then all of a sudden, um, you should see the appendix eventually pop its head out at you. And then as fast as you can see it, it's gone again because you, you moved past the area. Then you go, oh, wait, wait, back up. And then you go back and you're like, wait for it, wait for it. You're compressing, you're compressing. And then all of a sudden, whoop, pops its head at you. And then you can freeze the image and show that to somebody. It's kind of what we're seeing here. Um, we're going along. We can see some bowel peristalsis here. Here's psoas muscle right here. And psoas muscle is being compressed. You're, you're basically, the probe is up here on the skin line, sub subcutaneous fat. Here's muscle right here. And we're going to push that abdominal wall musculature all the way down until it comes in contact with psoas. And we can see some psoas right here. And here's a loop of bowel right here. Maybe that's the appendix. I'm not sure. But it gets squirt, squirts out of the way. Here's some iliac vessel here. That appendix is becomes um, ovoid and squishes out of the way. And it's nicely peristalsing. So in this case, this is definitely a negative study in from what we can see so far. I should say no appendicitis visualized is the way you kind of document it. But that's the idea. Here's another case. I'm going to show you a bunch of positives now. Um, this is um, so we can see some abdominal wall musculature here. Maybe this is rectus. Maybe this is um, abdominal oblique. And here's what it looks like when it's positive. It's a non-compressible tubular structure. This one measured to almost a centimeter wall-to-wall uh, -wall there, outside wall to outside wall for the appendix there. And let's see, here's another one here. Uh, I think uh, they came to, here they're going to measure this sort of outside wall to outside wall. And I would actually drop the caliper right here. I think this is an example of where not to drop the caliper. But the idea is you want to go here. And still have normal. Um, and now in this case here, we're just doing a lot of compressing, and no matter what, 
how hard we compress. We're look, walking around everywhere, um, compressing. Here's, here's some psoas muscle. Here's some bowel peristalsis with some air in it, abdominal oblique. We see loops of bowel fluted. Here's psoas muscle right here coming. We saw psoas. It looks like psoas is coming up this way. What's happening is we're pushing this all the way down towards psoas, right? So all this tissue is compressible. We never see the appendix. We see a lot of peristalsing bowel, but we don't actually see the appendix here. And, um, and that's just that's part of the study. So when you practice on this, this is likely what you're going to see on a normal individual. Just psoas coming all oblique. We've got acute appendicitis. We can see this blind-ended tubular structure. Um, we're doing a lot of compression. It's non-compressible tubular structure in the right lower quadrant. This one's 8 millimeters. So this is kind of the idea. Here's here's without compression. This is a still image protocol without compression. This is with compression here. We see the psoas muscle is here. We see the iliac artery, iliac vein. And then when we compress them together, here's psoas. And here's the appendix. It's, uh, it's it's non-compressible. We're able to squirt out away some of the free fluid. When you see free fluid like that, um, it actually helps to outline the appendix. You can see it easier. And uh, that free fluid um, may be one of the tip-offs that there's been perforation of the appendix. And these patients may be quite sick, have elevated white blood cell counts, be febrile, um, and require immediate um, IV antibiotics and surgical consultation. I've noticed that more and more lately with uh, perforated appendicitis, Patients are getting IV antibiotics and um, and not surgery, um, depending, and that's a case by case thing. But it seems like the trend is towards conservative therapy with IV antibiotics and setting perforated appendicitis rather than going in and uh, doing um, uh, washout. So um, to conclude here, I just wanted to show you this is uh, what we want to do with the ultrasound technique. It's good to have a full bladder. I know that sounds uncomfortable, but that's part of it. The way we get around some of the discomfort of doing appendicitis ultrasound is with analgesia. Um, I'm a big fan of a short-acting narcotic like fentanyl, um, which can be given, and it's, you push it, the patient feels great. 20 minutes later, it's out of their system. Um, that's why I like that drug. And the, any short-acting narcotic will work that way. Um, you want to start at the area. see what see if we can find what's bothering you and the kid sort of gets into it it's like a video game um, and again it's the psoas, psoas muscle you want to be able to identify the iliac vessels and not call those appendicitis this is just um, another example here of appendicitis here we can see a fecalith or a, a poop stone in the distal appendix causing um, a shadowing here and, um, and that's nice it's pretty cool on ultrasound. looks just like any other stone does, kidney stone, gallstone. Otherwise, it exudes some shadowing. So in general, ultrasound is a great alternative to doing a CT scan. We want to think about giving the patient some analgesia. It's important to have the patient in the right position of comfort and always look at things um, in two views. We've talked a lot about um, the pylorus and the um, intestines and the uh, heart. We, in all these, whenever I mention organ, you'll notice there's a recurring theme here. I talked about looking at things in two different views, and you're reconstructing that anatomy in your brain in a three-dimensional image, um, and that will come to you over time. Target signs with um, indecision, and I think about ultrasound in terms of ruling it in because it has a poor spec ultrasound has a poor specificity for appendicitis, so I can't really rule it out, um, but it does help to avoid a CT scan if I can rule it in. Now, just one more thing, um, just keep in mind, uh, again, for CT scans, um, that the one of the ways I explain it to patients who sometimes patients are kind of demanding they want a CT scan right now, and if I think I can get there another way or if I can talk them out of it, this is one way I say that, a CT scan of your abdomen and pelvis is like getting 500 chest x-rays, a CT scan of your chest is like 400, you can read all these here, um, and then if you look up the number of chest x-rays worth of radiation for an ultrasound, still zero. Thank you very much.